evening. Welcome to um, the last in this series at Mansfield Public Talks. I'm absolutely delighted today to have um, with me Mel Clark, who's the President and the Chief Executive Officer of the Clean Tech Alliance. Um, Mel um, studied an interdisciplinary arts and sciences um, degree, um, which was about communicating across the curriculum and then spent 25 years working in the nonprofit sector um, before moving to the Clean Tech Alliance, which is a trade group of various um, organizations uh, who are interested in clean tech of various forms and now operates across uh, 17 states and four provinces of um, the United States. Um, I asked her what she'd been doing in, in Oxford. Apparently she's been studying uh, or looking at um, space. Um, I can't read my own writing, barbed wire, space barbed wire and dinosaurs. Um, but I think that's the sort of diversity of interests which are really um, needed to um, think about some of the problems that are facing us um, today. So thank you very much for joining us, Mel. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm delighted to be here tonight. Um, at the Clean Tech Alliance, uh, we, we are the largest industry association in America focused on uh, climate tech and clean energy. Uh, and we work with more than 1,100 member companies uh, and, and a, a wide variety of industry verticals. Uh, we have companies working on everything from bug farming to fusion energy. And there's a lot of space around the Mobius strip between those, those two industries. So we, we get a really, uh, really interesting variety of topics that we get to talk about uh, on a daily basis. And today I want to talk to you a lot about um, what we do and what is happening in our region in the Pacific Northwest to help create conditions that can drive clean tech innovation. And we need innovation. We need a lot of innovation to solve our climate crises. Uh, carbon in the atmosphere is at record levels. The IPCC reports we're going to miss the goal of holding to 1.5 degrees of warming. We're going to need to invent, scale, and adopt a lot of climate tech to reverse that, the damage that we've done while we're simultaneously inventing, scaling, and building new clean energy systems across the globe. The world has built itself out of some very large problems in the past. Uh, and we can do it again. We have to do it again. But there's no time to waste. We need to innovate rapidly. We need to force innovation, and you can't do that. So how do you solve that problem? But first, a little bit more about me. I grew up in rural Kansas, outside the town with the world's largest grain elevator. This is not a place to get stuck at a railroad crossing behind a train. The grain elevator is half a mile long. Residents jokingly say they keep a copy of War and Peace in the car in case they do get caught by a train. We'll talk a little bit more about silos today. There is a reason for the picture beyond uh, where I grew up. My grandmother's family was from Paisley, Scotland, known for Paisley. Uh, they were all weavers. And I feel a little bit like that's what I do every day, working with such a wide variety of industries. I weave a lot of different threads together in how I think and what we talk about. So today you're going to hear a little bit about my brain's journey through how you weave together a tapestry that can create innovation. So from Kansas, I've moved to Seattle, known as the Emerald City. Um, yes, I've heard all the Dorothy jokes, all of them. Running a small nonprofit requires that you be a generalist and do a little bit of everything. I'm not a scientist, but I love science. I'm not an MBA, but I work with business and value education in all forms. I'm not special. I'm not from a special background. Solving climate change isn't going to take a special individual. It's going to take a team of people. The team needs to be structured right, with the right culture, and sit in the right ecosystem. Years ago, I read that the secret to successful innovation was to simply have a biologist on your team. The article was aimed at the high-tech sector, and it was trying to ensure that everyone on your team wasn't trained to think the exact same way. But in my last company, I had three biologists, and I thought, oh, perfect, I've solved it. We're going to crush this. But what does it take to really nurture and deliberately create conditions to foster innovation? Rolling out new clean tech solutions is going to take a lot of nurturing from ideation 
to wide scale adoption. And it takes an ecosystem with the tools to help at every stage. In Washington, we have the regulatory environment that's going to create innovation. We have a clean energy fund where the state is investing in new clean energy projects. We have our Clean Energy Transformation Act, which will, uh, while our grid is already 80% clean and produces 25% of all the hydropower in America, it's going to be 100% green by 2030 and 100% green with no offsets by 2045. We've recently, in the last two years, passed and adopted a clean fuel standard and a cap and invest program, which will take effect in 2023 and should link with California's cap and trade markets. Clean Tech Alliance members get funding from the Clean Energy Fund. They help advise on these policies and the rulemaking as these things form. They sit on councils to review and update implementation strategy. And we understand that regulation is going to be required to induce change. The regulation has to be smart enough that businesses can adapt. So we have the stick. We have the strongest stick in America and the broadest suite of clean tech and climate tech legislation. But sticks don't create innovation. You can't force innovation. Regulation moves the lever marked adoption. But the industry needs things to adopt. We also have the research facilities. We have universities with innovative clean tech focused labs and centers, two national labs that we work with, Department of Energy funded labs, uh, and institutions and, and research institutions, the desire to partner with industry and support spin outs. The University of Washington's Clean Energy Test Beds and Clean Energy Institutes, we work with um, regularly, and they are poised to work with industry uh, and do prototyping for industry, not just with academic projects. And that's a critical piece of the ecosystem. You're familiar with some of the largest industries that have come out of Seattle. But Seattle has some well-known innovations you may not have heard of. We invented the flight attendant. Uh, the first flight attendants were nurses uh, to take care of, of guests and passengers while aviation was still uh, a frontier and unknown. But they also were required to rivet the seats back down in between flights. Um, we brought you grunge, vinyl records, compact discs, the down parka and the backpack, uh, and a couple of maybe other larger companies you've heard of. Mar Microsoft, Starbucks, this online bookstore experiment called Amazon. Who misses Clippy? Anyone? Seattle was rated eighth out of the top clean tech innovation hubs in America in a recent review. We work in a larger region than Seattle, so we think maybe we're better than number eight. Um, but adding uh, uh, large metropolitan areas are cooperating across borders. Innovation isn't happening at a city level. It's happening at a regional level. Um, they host some of the continent's cutting edge centers of technology. This Cascadia Innovation Corridor, uh, the strip of land down the west coast there, is perhaps the best example of one of these innovation hubs. And it's been described as the Pacific Northwest is characterized by an open and inclusive culture, a heterogeneous population, and the ability to create technology with a focus on social good. That list, inclusion, heterogeneous population, creativity, and a focus on social good combined to make our region, in my opinion, the perfect incubator for clean tech innovation. And clean tech needs more support long described as having a longer valley of death than other industries, from ideation to adoption. High tech in particular has a quick time. It's led clean tech to struggle to raise venture capital in the Emerald City, where our VCs are conditioned to believe you just ship some beta code and six months later you cash out on your exit. Clean tech's never going to work that way. Um, third derivative produced this graph uh, in, in mid-2020 uh, and called for faster and more climate tech innovation and funding. Another version of the clean tech valley of death compared to traditional industry, uh, clean tech investor David Mount declared in mid-2021 that clean tech as an industry is finally overcoming this stumbling block as investors begin to understand clean tech appropriately takes longer. It's not failure. He highlights the enormous market opportunity that will be on the other side of the valley. A lot of people are going to build enormous companies and make a lot of money building clean tech and clean energy solutions. 
Markets are another component of a thriving ecosystem, but like policy, they're on the adoption and scaling end of the journey. The Cascadia region has had some really decent run of VC investments in recent years, uh, even during the, the, the pandemic, and the pace seems to be picking up. So I'm very hopeful that last slide, who said maybe we've, we've socialized the idea of the longer valley of death and, and the VC is coming to the clean tech industry is, is truly real. This report was uh, mid to late 2021. And since then, we've had two large companies in our region, both Clean Tech Alliance members, raise a significant amount of capital. Uh, Helion is one of four fusion research companies that's preparing to commercialize fusion energy in the Seattle region. And uh, private capital agrees with them that, that they may be there first or certainly soon and ready with a $2.2 billion investment last fall. And Group 14 Technologies is working on some innovative longer range batteries. They're talking about a thousand mile range in vehicles and they just closed $400 million last month, led by Porsche. So the investment is coming. We always want more, we need it faster, but it seems like it's improving. So a little bit more about the Clean Tech Alliance. We are an industry trade association. Uh, we run traditional networking, educational events, informal mentoring, advocacy, and offer shared business services to help promote and support the sector. And it's exactly that, traditional. It's not exactly a dynamic mandate for innovation in and of itself. We do have a startup accelerator program in its seventh year, the Cascadia Clean Tech Accelerator. And you can see we do some tracking on the uh, demographics of our founding teams, some of their outcomes. But I wanna talk a little bit more about what we're doing to try and break down those silos between researchers and commercialization, to accelerate new clean tech, to promote the sector, to solve joint challenges more deliberately. And on this slide, you can certainly see that we like partnerships and collaborations. Washington State has rolled out a new program, their Innovation Cluster Accelerator Program, and they've funded nine new industry clusters, five of them focused on clean technology and clean energy, and we were delighted to be selected to stand up one of their clusters. Cluster economic development is formally a new concept in America. Europe is far more familiar with it, and we are using the European model of cluster development. And Washington has chosen this model to grow their economy in the coming years and accelerate the adoption of clean technology simultaneously. They intend to build a super cluster of clusters unparalleled anywhere in the US. Another fantastic piece of the ecosystem. And for us at Clean Tech Alliance, this represents the opportunity to create new programming that lets us take more deliberate action to accelerate our sector, tear down barriers, and champion innovation. Under our ICAP program, we will more deliberately convene programs on diversity, workforce, and shared innovation challenges for individual technology stacks. For our fusion companies, we're undertaking market research and communications projects. For the waste uh, energy transfer industry, we're working on recognition of waste energy transfer as a renewable energy and conducting pre-feasibility studies for particular applications. We have new Department of Energy funded programs, uh, the Northwest Clean Tech Innovation Network, which is a collaboration between industry and universities to aid and speed tech transfer, a technology lookbook, same goals, hardware prototyping to help innovators and investors get their first prototypes off the ground and get them moving faster. Uh, and we're funding an entrepreneur in residence to help with clean technology uh, startups. We have new workforce programs. We're connecting with Washington State's existing regional networks on STEM education, to which there are added industry verticals this year. And most of the ICAP clusters have also chosen to become the industry vertical on workforce, creating important linkages. These new programs, are where we think that we can foster innovation faster. And I've deliberately segmented them into a separate half of our organization, separate from our traditional industry association. And here's why. Here's a fascinating book that I recommend everyone read. I've read it a couple of times now and I'm sure I'll, I'll crawl back through it again, called Loon Shots. And this book gets to the heart of how structure can destroy innovation. A moonshot is the launching of a spacecraft to the moon or an ambitious and expensive goal widely expected to have great significance. A loon shot is a neglected project widely dismissed. Its champion written off as unhinged. 
The call states that technologies that transform industries often begin with lone inventors championing crazy ideas. We actually have a startup in Seattle working on inventing a fusion battery. It doesn't use banana peels. And you all likely think that that founder is likely, well, unhinged, because we all know that fusion will be ready in 30 years. But the reality is fusion will be ready when the world needs it to be. And that's right now. Small teams innovate, but large groups of people are needed to translate those ideas into products that work, scaling and adopting. When teams with the means to scale reject the new ideas, breakthroughs remain buried inside labs or trapped underneath the rubble of failed companies. The call continues, there's something at the core of how large groups behave that we just don't understand. And he believes that structure matters more than culture. I believe they both matter equally, and I'm gonna talk more about culture in a bit. Jeff Bezos is famous for having said, any individual team shouldn't be bigger than you can feed with two pizzas. Structure. Loonshot's models references the scientific principle of phase separation. At the right temperature, water will become ice. Traffic will jam when car density reaches a certain threshold and applies it to business. Organizations will stop innovating when they reach a certain size. It is inevitable. And companies that cease to innovate get surpassed. Physicist Phil Anderson advances the concept. More is different. The whole becomes not only more, but different than the sum of the parts, the flow of liquids, the rigidity of solids. You can't analyze one molecule of water and understand phases of matter. They are collective behaviors. Bacall says it is the same for teams and companies. The behavior of an individual doesn't explain the group. Understanding the phases of an organization are like the phases of matter, explains why teams turn and innovation is abandoned. Here's a very expensive example. Nokia, on the rise, with enough of their remaining startup culture in the early 2000s, sold half the smartphones on the planet and was briefly the most profitable company, the most valuable company in Europe. Fortune magazine at the time described Nokia as the least hierarchical big company in the world. And their CEO said, you're allowed to have a bit of fun, to think outside the box, to think outside the norm, to make a mistake. Who has a Nokia phone on them right now? Bacall shows us why. In 2004, a handful of excited Nokia engineers created a new kind of phone. Internet ready, big color touchscreen display, high resolution camera. They proposed another crazy idea to go with it, an online app store. And the same bit of fun think outside the norm leadership team shot both ideas down. Three years later, they emerged on stage in San Francisco. Who has an Apple phone? Show of hands, most of us. Someone write down our poll results and we can call it science. You have to write it down or it's not science, right? So five years later, after the ideas are shot down, Nokia is all but irrelevant with a mobile peak and exit, yielding a staggering devaluation of a quarter trillion dollars. According to Bacall, a wildly innovative team had turned. In every field, we see legendary teams suddenly and mysteriously turn, and it isn't the people. A big, risk-averse, conservative corporate CEO suddenly moves to a startup, and she'll pound the table to support wild new ideas. The same person is conservative in one situation and innovative in another. Bacall outlines how to control that transition, how to keep water at the state you need it to be. Basically, the innovative arm has to be separate. It has to be free to fail because large scale, and Bacall calls it franchise, arms are results in profit driven and that punishes risk and failure. When people organize into a team, they create two competing forces, says Bacall, two forms of incentive, stake and rank. In small groups, everyone has a high stake in the project outcome and rank is devalued. In large orgs, your stake in the outcome decreases while the perks of rank increase. That well-paid CEO, perks of rank. The flat structure of a startup, no perks of rank. Everyone's working ridiculous hours. The call includes when the incentives of stake and rank cross is when teams turn. 
I've inserted this slide from one of my favorite philosophers that explains the same concept. Conveniently, you can just read it while I have some water. So that's why we have to foster more startups to have clean tech innovation. They are where we will innovate our way to solving climate change. That is why large organizations have to phase separate their innovative divisions. Disney Imagineering is not controlled by the same team that puts out princess toys in mass or Marvel movies, the ultimate franchise model. The concept McCall presents aren't necessarily new or rare, but they're well laid out to clearly articulate the need for phase separation and an understanding of why paying attention to structure in this way is critical. Described another way and more relevant to my industry and driven by demand, authors state that if history offers any lessons about innovation with respect to energy, it is that harnessing new sources of energy usually takes a long time. New ways of capturing energy often emerge from the fringe, remember Doc Brown, and are slow to catch on compared to competing proven technologies. In other words, the franchise or the known exerts selection pressure against innovation. Innovation has to fight for a seat at the table. Even when innovation occurs, scaling and adoption do not follow in a linear fashion when systems are not built to nurture and equip them. Gia and Crabtee give an early example. The development of the wheel and the axle concept at scale was likely held back by a dearth of quality tools for carpentry, chisels, and gouges. Again, this highlights the longer valley of death for clean tech innovation. In this case, it was supply chain and workforce portions of the ecosystem creating the lag. Local conditions, local variation conditions in the region can also affect adoption of a new innovation. This is the ecosystem's effect on adoption. Even if culture or structure are correct, your idea might not get adopted. And here's a very old example. In early cultures in Mesoamerica, they invented the wheel, and it was only used in children's toys. Partially due to mountainous terrain, partially due to a lack of domesticated beasts of burden, likely a myriad of other reasons, which I expect included a healthy dose of this is the way we have always done it. The way we have always done it is a franchise point of view. Organizations focused on maintaining the status quo will not innovate. Let's also recognize that innovation can be distinct from invention. Mesoamerica invented the wheel, but nothing, innovat nothing innovative happened with it. NASA scientists invented the post-it note didn't know what to do with it. They were going to throw it away. Secretaries at NASA innovated what to do with it. They were the innovators, but not the inventors. That's also why we're adding more tech transfer programs to our work. The inventors might not be the innovators. We've all seen those middle manager projects that suck up bandwidth and yet have zilch for innovation and don't move anything forward. In the business as usual environment, killing those projects admits failure, and failure is punished, so they live on. The net effect, the appearance of not failing, becomes the goal or the outcome. Success is bred when projects are killed early and often. I've seen stats that say only 20% of innovative projects succeed in the market long term. In clean tech, it may not even be that high. Although the long valley of death from innovation to scaled adoption is enormous and could blur an accurate understanding of the actual success rate. Innovation is bred where teams have the freedom or even are incentivized to fail. Structure has to be right or innovation does not occur. Next, I want to talk about culture. To maximize innovation, the team's culture must be genuinely and deeply diverse. To come back to Kansas for a moment, there's no place like home. Why did the Yellow Brick Road and Dorothy's journey, what did the Yellow Brick Road and Dorothy's journey actually show us? She wanted to go where? She wasn't trying to go to Oz, she was trying to go home. But a different home. The tornado, the disruption, became the device with which she left ideation. She wanted to be home, but she wanted a different home. She needed to feel different, something wasn't right. She's magically transported over the valley of death to a place where adoption has occurred. Diversity. The fantastical characters are a stand-in for a diversity in the way 1930s America and possibly much of the world still today couldn't fathom. 
Dorothy is the undisputed leader of an unlikely male trio, the lion, the tin man, the scarecrow, none of whom are traditionally masculine characters. There's your diverse founding team. The two witches have power, and they're respected by male and female characters alike. One is evil and one is good, or is one simply judged to be evil because she was too hard, not nice enough. Fans of Wicked know Elphaba is not so stereotypical. We're led to believe throughout that the wizard, the male, will have the power to grant their wishes, and in the end we learn he doesn't have any power at all. Instead, Dorothy finds within herself what she needs to, complement, to accomplish her goals when she's in an environment that allows for that reality. And Kansas in 1930 wasn't a setting that could allow for the heroine's journey. Powerful women, four diverse teams, Oz was. Diversity is critical because it delivers thought. Differences in thought, earned through lived experience, training, or critically, demographics. Selecting for varying demographics helps us uncover and select for that bouquet of thinking. Commitment to diversity, rather than lip service about diversity, allows for every voice to be equally heard and lets the Dorothys learn what they are capable of contributing to the team. Because when they don't contribute, innovation falters. Next favorite book, can't stop rereading this one. In The Loudest Duck, Laura Leesewood shows how women and minorities feel invisible in the workplace, even where all in the dominant social group have the very best of intentions. Studies show many women use a typical upward inflection in their speech, learned as a relational technique at a young age. Margaret Thatcher went to a speech coach to learn how to drop the inflection so she would sound more like a man and be heard by men. Yet many women who try and act more like men are considered too aggressive. It's important to look at every kind of diversity, not just gender. Really benefiting from diversity is a complex but richly rewarding mission, says journalist James Sorowicki in The Wisdom of Crowds. And he reiterates that what we're looking, really looking for is cognitive diversity or the differing ways people think. But don't fall into the trap of letting that be an excuse to avoid demographic diversity and simply state it's all fine because you have diversity of thought. Sorowiecki continues, if you, have a homo homo <coughs> if you have a homogeneous group and add an additional like member, they will bond quickly. But the incremental creativity between them is slight. Add an unlike member to the group, and while they do not bond quickly because they are not alike, incremental creativity is much greater. It's not just gender and race that should be considered. Physical appearance, such as height, marital and family status, accent, country of origin, economic level of upbringing. If you like to golf, if you drink at happy hour, all of these affect how you are treated at work and how you are viewed at work, and that affects your results as a contributor. And that affects your team's ability to truly build a culture that gets it and yields creative, high-functioning, diverse teams where all contribute. In the book Blink, Malcolm Gladwell presents that 16% of men in the US, so 16% of men are six foot two or taller, but 57% of male Fortune 500 CEOs are six foot two or taller. When we see tall men, unconscious bias says leader. Do any of you have any research indicating that leadership ability is correlated with skeletal structure? Shorter men are at a disadvantage, not viewed as a leader until they prove it. And if you're in a prove it workspace, you are not maximizing your creative contribution. It's not just Noah's Ark, says Leesewood. Two women, two Asians, two people with disabilities, and two African Americans. Diversity accomplished. While tracking statistics may be necessary, it is not sufficient. Left to itself, it only yields a prove it culture. And a prove it culture is difficult to re engineer. Diversity training is not sufficient. A study of 830 mid-sized companies in the US found typical diversity training exercises were followed by a 7.5% drop in the number of women in management. African Americans in management fell by 10 to 12%. Yes, we've all been told you only improve what you measure, but it has to go deeper than that. Teams and effective diversity training must understand it is their own inherent behaviors and unconscious approaches that hinder success for everyone. In other words, focus inward on your actions and your impact on others, not on others' difference. 
If you want a culture of innovation, you have to nurture non-homogenous teams that focus on how their actions affect each teammate's ability to contribute so that like and unlike members are heard the same. And Leafwood outlines this in the loudest stuff. Elegantly and simply, it's a fantastic read. The research all backs her up. Companies that get diversity right are more successful on just about every metric I can find. Report after report confirms diversity equals profit and innovation. Companies in the top quartile for gender diversity outperform their competitors by 15%, and those in the top quartile for ethnic diversity outperform their competitors by 35%. A Deloitte study found that when employees think their organization is committed to and supportive of diversity, they feel included, and their ability to innovate increases by 83%. For companies ranking in the top quartile of uh, executive board diversity, return on equity is 53% higher on average than for those in the bottom quartile. At the same time, margins of the most diverse companies were 14% higher on average than those of the least diverse companies. One study found that companies that have more diverse management teams have 19% higher revenue due to their innovations. And another study found that diverse teams make decisions twice as fast with half the number of meetings. Sign me up as non-diverse teams. And they deliver decisions that have 60% better results. A final advantage, increased diversity and inclusion is higher revenues for your business. According to a study by Harvard Business Review, employees with 2D diversity are 45% more likely to report their firm's market share grew over the previous year. And employees with 2D diversity are 70% more likely to report their company captured a new market from a year earlier. This slide is yet another study. Our teams need to know how to bring their best selves to the table to maximize diversity. Not a checklist, but output. Studies suggest that diversity properly realized is a little more like improv. It's not a checklist. It's yes and. Bring forth your best effort. It, it's to improve. It's about it, it, making your scene partner look good in improv. Whatever your scene partner does, you yes and it and you build on it. You give them a gift and set them up so that they can be the most successful. You need to make your teammate look good. It's about offering your best effort and giving them a gift to work with. Not no, not yes, but yes and is genuine inclusion, where you are invested in the other's success. And remember, to innovate successfully, you have to fail a lot. And it's OK to fail in improv and look a little ridiculous. If your team truly adopts diversity, if they're each invested in the other's rapid and repeated failure, and then you all say yes and and try something else together until you find your Oz, you've structured and cultured for innovation. Clean tech needs a little more Oz. The, the team with permission to fail, and those teams that have the permission to fail need to do so faster. When teams are genuinely diverse, states Franz Johnson in the Medici effect, they create more unlikely ideas. They are better at making decisions. Teams with a higher level of difference up the odds of choosing ideas that are game changing. And they are better at making innovation happen. Understanding the why helps us deliberately design teams for this kind of accelerative diversity. The next book I can't stop rereading, Invisible Women, Data Bias in a World Designed for Men. Carolyn Perez, Perez presents a compelling case that the gap in data about women is a cause of project failure, poor results, unintended outcomes, and a range of, of problems from the annoying, the average office temperatures have women reaching for jumpers all summer long, to the deadly, undiagnosed heart attacks because symptoms aren't typical. Women are frequently invisible, at best, to data sets. And I'm all for big data, but I'm also clear, garbage in equals garbage out. Men typically fail to factor in female-specific concerns because, stay with me here, this is complicated, they are not women. Returning to clean tech from big data. Clean tech does have a diversity problem. The industry is pale and male at all levels. CEOs, startup teams, boots on the ground, union workers, and that's certainly not new. The globe also currently has a workforce shortage problem. This overlaid to the need to electrify everything, retrofit basically every building on the planet, invent, adopt, scale, and build new sources of energy, pretty much means we don't have enough ready and trained workers to meet the coming wave of clean tech demand. And since the last two years have been such smooth sailing for workforce across the globe, I'm sure we'll solve this quickly. 
For instance, states in the U.S., there are grant programs to help impacted coal communities transition, upskill, rescale, and retrain their almost entirely male workforce. In 2016, the industry provided about 50,000 jobs, earning a median $59,000 annual wage. And politicians vie to be the champion of America's working class and photo op and pose with these coal workers and promise new clean tech living wage union jobs for this displaced workforce. And that's fine. Yes, and. It's also insufficient and it's inaccurate. <clears throat> Looking at all sector jobs to achieve decarbonization, an aggressive national commitment to jobs to electrify all aspects of our economy would create up to 25 million good paying American jobs over the next five years. So those coal workers are 0.002% of this pollution. Globally, jobs in the energy sector are projected to increase from 18 million today to 26 million in 2050. No one has enough coal or oil workers to meet this need. So where will this workforce come from? Let's compare those coal workers with the actual real low wage working class in America. Perez states 924,000 strong cleaning and housekeeping workforce with a median annual income of $21,000. I was in Hanover Mesa last week, and this was an EU poster showing us how they envision their future energy workforce. If we don't inspire little girls from low-income native immigrants and communities of color, their mothers, their teachers, their school counselors, to view them as the future of our clean energy and clean technology, hard hot wear and good wage earning job future, we will simply not have the workforce we need to construct our way to preserving a human habitable, agriculturally viable climate across most of the globe. Even as we build towards this workforce success on the implementation end of the spectrum, diversity shortfalls will continue to plague clean tech innovation. Let's dive into some more examples of how a diverse lens is critical at the design stage so that we can more efficiently impact adoption. Prez's work is a gem of Demonstrating how a lack of data, uh, presence, and representation make for bad policy. <clears throat> and this example also uh, is a really good example of, of leaders that are just viewing diversity as a required checkbox. Uh, the book tells the story of a Swedish city official offended by the need to review all policy through a gendered lens and joked that snow clearing was something the gender people would keep their noses out of, which predictably got the gender people thinking. The short story is when they moved from an arterial first snow clearing policy to a pedestrian and public transit first policy, the city saved money. Because 79% of pedestrian inju energy injuries occurred in the winter, 69% of those were women. Women trip chain, take a kid to school, run an errand, help an aging relative, and then go to work and are more likely to take public transit to do it all. Clearing the arterials smooths the path for men that commute to work and commute home. Since changing to a pedestrian transit first, a single season can now save a single community around 3.2 million pounds. The original snow clearing schedule hadn't been deliberately designed to benefit men at the expense of women. The men who originally devised the schedule knew how they traveled and designed for that. They didn't deliberately set out to exclude anyone. They just didn't consider if women's needs might be different. It's critical to develop projects based on sex desegregated data and include women in the planning. A clean tech example. Humans, mostly women, have been cooking on three stone fires basically forever. Three stones on the ground, fuel to burn in the middle, and a pot balance on top. Biomass cooking fuels are still the primary cooking energy source for 75% of South Asia and 80% of Sub-Saharan Africa. Traditional stoves using these fuels give off toxic fumes and don't do good things for the planet. Development agencies have been trying to introduce clean stoves since the 1950s with deforestation prevention goals and now climate goals and occasionally health and equity outcomes for women in mind too. The adoption has never gone well and efforts were abandoned when ties to deforestation fell out of fashion. At this rate, fusion energy is gonna be ready sooner. Hillary Clinton renewed the focus in 2010 with the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves. Yet a 2014 UN publication notes data on access to efficient stoves is sparse and a focus on electrification and grid connection rather than socioeconomic impact is still the focus. Data is not collected on user needs before development projects begin. And shockingly, clean stoves have nearly all been rejected by users, the women. 
The failure to go from ideation to scaled adoption is because the women were invisible to the entire process. It's a culture problem. Low adoption has been blamed on the users, again, women, for being one, from a conservative culture, and two, needing education in usage. The women were blamed for the failure to adopt a product they had no agency in the design of. If Ford, <coughs> who you can bet, Ooh, that's about the right slide. There we go. If Ford, who you can bet, does focus groups and market research, doesn't sell enough F-150 Lightning, are they going to blame it on the ranchers? Will anyone say that the trucks weren't purchased because the guy in the John Deere hat was from a conservative culture, needed education in how to use the truck? That's absurd. If the truck makes the farmer's job harder, she isn't going to buy it. Looking deeper into the stoves, a USAID-funded report repeatedly and pointedly demonstrated that all stove, all the stove designs studied increased cooking time and required more attention, increasing the women's workload. Nevertheless, the report concluded that the women needed improvement, not the stoves. The women needed education on how great and improved the stoves were, rather than educating stove designers on how to not increase women's already 15-hour long workday. A study from Yale demonstrated even when women want to adopt cleaner stoves, they can't afford them or do not have independent purchasing power and men don't prioritize the purchase. Yet the press release read, despite efforts for change, Bangladeshi women prefer to use pollution-causing cook stoves as if the women were perverse rather than lacking in purchasing authority. Perhaps the silly women choosing air pollution made for a better headline. Let's blame those hotel workers making 22,000 a year for not purchasing a new Tesla because they prefer pollution-causing cars. An expensive Tesla's alone won't solve climate change. We need policy that adds the J, justice, so adoption can benefit and be accessible to all communities. Trickle-down clean tech isn't going to work. I have some experience being at the low end of the economic stick in a pro-trickle-down economic state, Kansas. And that ultimately is another theme along the yellow brick road. Dorothy wants her grassroots life and family, but yearns to have access to a world of magical inventions and full color living. Bombs Kansas is portrayed in black and white because the people there knew what was out of their reach and what wouldn't trickle down. Dorothy sets out to disrupt that distribution system. Henry Ford inherently knew this when he made corporate policy that created economic access to his product and the time to use it for his low wage workers. He didn't build his empire because billionaires bought his luxury automobiles. He got wealthy because of bottom-up adop adoption by the Auntie M's and the Uncle Henry's. So let's say your diverse team has done their homework and has a product that's going to be wildly popularly popular and serve diver diverse communities. Congratulations. You still have another hurdle to navigate, and that is the clean tech valley of death. According to the Third Ways Entrepreneurial Equity Report, in 2020, female entrepreneurs received 2.5%. 3% of all venture capital in the U.S. Black entrepreneurs, even less, 1.2% of venture dollars. Women of color, even more dismal, uh, half of 1%. The pandemic may have contributed to that decline. Uh, in 2019, women earned a whopping 2.8% of the investment dollars. Speculation why COVID caused the decline includes investors sticking to who or what they knew, swinging the pendulum back to favor an old school boys club. HBR goes on to detail, only 12% of staff at VC firms are female. Most firms don't have a single female partner. Of the female partners that do exist, only 2.4% are founders. Only one can, one can only extrapolate how few of them are women of color. The Alliance for Entrepreneurial Equity reports that female and minority hires at VC firms are mostly in support and clerical roles, and in 2000, only 7% of firms had a black partner, male or female, and only 10% of female partners have held their position for more than 10 years. The little inclusion that does exist is recent. HBR reports that when women VCs do make decisions, they are two times as likely to invest in female founders. In a 2019 study of venture capital investors, Morgan Stanley found that just 13% of white male VCs surveyed prioritized investments in multicultural founders. Just one third prioritized companies founded by women. These percentages stand in stark contrast to the women and non-white males that were surveyed who were twice as likely to make those prioritizations. Other studies show that female VC founders, uh, partners are more than three times as likely to invest in startups as female CEOs. And it turns out, good for business to make those investments. 
Women-led startups that do receive funding are far more likely to be successful. They deliver more than twice as much revenue per dollar invested. They hire two and a half times more women. Companies with a female founder and a female exec hire six times as many women. A 2020 Goldman Sachs study examining nearly 500 large equity funds in the United States found that female-only and mixed-gender investment teams outperform teams run entirely by men. Pitch book fund performance data shows that 69% of venture firms that scored in the top quartile between 29 and 2018 had women in decision-making roles. Diversity, in my opinion, is why the companies are more profitable. Earlier, we examined why this is the case on innovative teams. The same holds true for founding teams and investment teams. According to the Alliance for Inter Entrepreneurial Equity, more than 70% of startups that raise venture capital have a white male co-founder who went to Stanford or Harvard. When you couple that lack of gender and racial diversity in VC boardrooms with a lack of variety in educational background, you end up with teams that often think in a similar fashion and solve problems at a slower rate. A recent study found that homogeneity has negative effects on investment exits and overall fund returns, including 6% lower success rates for investments by VCs with shared ethnicity and 12% lower success rates for VCs with shared school backgrounds. They call it the opportunity cost of homogeneity. When diversity is not at the table, we miss out on the value other perspectives bring to the teams and the ability to solve the world's problems in unique ways. The final cultural component that we want to talk about is STEM education. But I believe STEM has a missing component, and that's play. I got to work with the Aspen Institute's Project Play and helped form the Play Equity Coalition in Seattle. The project itself was focused on the lack of access for youth to play, participate in sports, access to programs, parks, and fields. Now, unsurprisingly, that access aligns with the same communities that are furthest from all the other resources. And who will be the most affected by climate change and who live in the most polluted communities? It's critical that children be given more access to play for emotional, physical, and cognitive development. It is critical that access to play in sports be diversified. 94% of women with a C-suite role played sports, 52% at the collegiate level. From the youngest levels, more boys and girls participate in organized sports, and rates for women's participation begin to decline dramatically at age 11. Adults that played sports at kids, and I think that never stopped playing, are adults that understand how to innovate. Play, especially early in free play, is the ultimate phase separation that allows for failure. And a final Midwest story. There's a Kenny Rogers song. Those of you old enough to know who Kenny Rogers is, is a country western singer. And it's called The Greatest. And it's about a little boy. He's out playing in the field with a ball and a bat. And he throws the ball up, and he swings, and he misses. And he throws the ball up, and he swings, and he misses. And he strikes himself out repeatedly. And he gets called home for supper. You know, it's the country western song, so you're expecting tears and drama and, and failure and dejection and misery. And instead, on the way home, he says, I am the greatest. That is a fact. But even I didn't know I could pitch like that. Play builds resilience. It teaches perseverance. It teaches seeing things differently. It teaches teamwork. And it teaches you how to give your all for your teammates. So there's a trip around my brain and the tapestry that I have woven together from my experience that helped me think about diversity and clean tech innovation to help our sector grow. So put it all together and apply these tools to change the planet. Structure and culture have to be right and in the right ecosystem for innovation to thrive. Understand phase separation, what you need to separate, and silos, what you need to tear down and put together. Operations should have phase separation. Always tear down silos between people. Separate your org into distinct phases to deliberately accelerate failure so we can burn through the bad ideas rapidly. We must fail faster and more often with cooler teams that remember how to play so we can get to what works and move it through the clean tech valley of death. Or we will not meet our, our climate goals. And never stop reading. Pull on threads. Weave an interesting new story. Read what you wouldn't normally read. Read the words of those who don't look like you and from backgrounds different than your own. And remember, you already have everything you need to make your own Oz. Thank you. Now, thank you for um, a fascinating talk. And um, you, I, I loved it because you confirm all my own biases, which are that it, we need diversity <laughs> to have innovation and, this, and we need innovation to solve the problems of the world. 
Um, but I'm interested in how, I, I completely get what you say about the checkbox approach to diversity and inclusion exercises and that people switch off, they can make them, they think, no, no, I've heard this before. How do you think we get people who are already have a majority of power, who are doing very well out of this, who unknown to them are getting the investment in unfair ways? How do we get people to buy in to that agenda and to imagine the need for it? Yeah, it, it, that's a, a really fabulous question, and if I had all of the answers to that, I would, uh, <laughs> I would be in a different place. Um, you, you know, I, I, we, we were talking about this earlier. I think with homogeneous culture, and from the outside you view it as closed-minded, people across the South, people across Midwest America, the nicest, kindest, most giving, shirt off their back, uh, neighbors you'll meet. But we have to change their definition of neighbor. If we can expand the definition of neighbor, we can solve a lot of problems. And I think I lean a lot into the statistics. We're doing great, we don't need to change, it's fine the way it is. I sat across the table from uh, an energy producing research company and he said, well, I'm just gonna play devil's advocate, but..." Yeah, no one in my industry cares. It's just, you know, everyone with these PhDs, it's all guys and it's fine and we don't need women and they can't hack it. It's about five months ago. And I said, well, if you want to do business in this state under this economic model and you don't have the diversity, you're not going to get the grant funding. And lo and behold, his industry had a DOE sponsored conference for two hours and the first hour was on diversity, and he had to eat his words. Mm -hmm. So if he wants national government funding for his project, you know, they stood up publicly and said, you won't do it without diversity. So we may have to get to some people through their wallets. Yeah. Um, and the other thing you were talking about that really, I am gonna let other people ask questions now. I can't help myself. Um, <laughs> it's a, Moderator's my prerogative, power while I've that's got right. It um, but the other thing that really interested me, you were talking about why the Pacific Northwest is a special place for innovation and climate and well, clean tech innovation in particular. Um, but it's, it, everything is based in the Pacific Northwest um, of the United States of America. The world is not going to make, these innovations aren't going to happen everywhere. And I just wonder whether you think other places can act in this way as an incubator, and if so, what they need to do that? And I think absolutely they can and they will. Um, I, th I think communities across Canada may be ahead on fostering and driving clean tech innovation. I mean, we work more with Canadian uh, governments and groups, so I have a little more familiarity with that. I think any region can assemble those pieces. Mm -hmm. You know, universities that, that research and tech transfer and welcome industry in, and uh, investors and innovators that champion social good in which problem set they're gonna work on. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you can put those pieces of an ecosystem together and then structure the companies in such a way that failure is rewarded, mm -hmm. you know, and put all those pieces together. And instead of just here is the recipe for what works, trying to dive into the why it works so that it can be replicated. Uh, and, and I think in many ways we need to make the planet a lot smaller. You know, we'll have uh, an ecosystem in the Seattle area where we have four fusion energy companies. We could be poised to export fusion to the world, but another community is gonna do something else. Uh, you know, Nance, Nance along the French coast is a leader in on offshore wind with in energy, and that needs to get exported to other places. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have to build those global connections so that we can transfer the technology around the world. And particularly in this environment, what do you think educators can do to encourage that mindset that, that innovation is needed and you need to be prepared to fail? Education is quite set up to get people to jump through hoops and try to succeed. Right, and do the right thing and do the best job. It, that's, a, that's a fascinating mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think it's, it's that mixing. It's getting industry involved mm -hmm. with education and students and setting up mentoring uh, and its challenges where teams can advance a project. Uh, in an educational setting where it's, you know, maybe okay to have some pieces of failure there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and study failure, mm -hmm. you know, inspire that study of failure mm -hmm. uh, as a way to know that it's okay to have that in the career. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, now I'm going to open it up because I know the people who've come on a bank holiday are going to be particularly interested. So yes, I've got a question here. Thank you. Can you just wait for a second for the microphone? 
Thank you very much uh, for this great, great presentation. I really resonate with the idea of phase uh, separation, and I would like to ask you, especially when we think about small teams, big teams, and um, different cultures, it seems to be the key critical um, process that you are managing it as an industry association is to move between those two sort of phases, right? And go oscillate between them, go back and forth. So what's your sense of um, the biggest barriers in your experience when you move between the two, for big, big to small, small to big? Um, within the Clean Tech Alliance within, or within, within our Within the members? Clean Tech Alliance yeah. and within the, net, the networks that you create. So within the Clean Tech Alliance, um, I've, I've really taken the innovation and the tech transfer and the commercialization and the acceleration programs and I've, I've stacked those all under um, a different staff member and they're hers and they're hers to run and they're not mine. And uh, she really leads that half of the organization to include tasking me with to-do lists and things she needs to move that forward. And so I'm trying to model that structure by making sure those programs run in that half of the organization and their leader is this staff member, not me. And so I don't come in and pivot that programming. Um, she and I talk about it in one-on-ones and coaching and strategy, but she directs that programming. Um, and she has more background in tech transfer and commercialization. And it's a really good, good role for her. And it utilizes more of her strengths. And so I try and model that by I am the traditional, um, I get sent on tasks and errands for the other half of the organization, but it really is hers to run. Um, and, you know, I see it play out in the industry with our, some of our members as well. Um, Boeing, who has some pretty challenging work ahead of them to decarbonize aviation, um, is doing investments into some electronic aviation and other innovations, but they're doing it by investing in startups. They're not doing it in-house, and I think it models that phase separation. Boeing is really good at what Boeing is good at, and they're not going to innovate. They're, you can't feed Boeing with two pizzas. They're not going to innovate in-house in the same way that needs to happen because aviation needs a lot of disruption. Uh, right now, projections are more than 50% of their carbon is going to have to be dealt with by offsets. We just don't know how to do it. We can't scale enough aviation biofuel, and we probably never will. Did that answer your question enough? Yes, actually, uh, a follow-up question, if I may. Um, since we have two representatives of two fields, you know, justice and clean tech innovation, mm -hmm. I wonder how you would apply this to um, equity considerations and the just transition, environmental justice that is very big also, I think, in grant funding schemes in the US, but also in the EU and in the UK, I think, as well. So how do you, how do you bridge this gap between the environmental community and uh, the clean tech folks? So it's, a, it's a lovely question. Um, I don't think we know yet how to successfully roll it out and complete and finish and get that done. The Clean Energy Transformation Act in Washington State does have a social justice component baked into it. It's unique in legislation in the Americas uh, because it requires that utilities in their project design, siting, and energy delivery must include low-income, diverse, and tribal nations in their planning. Uh, and they have to demonstrate and prove to the state that those constituents within their districts have had an authentic opportunity to be heard, and the utilities are actually financially incentivized to accomplish that, and that's what makes the legislation unique. So while it's kind of a stick legislation, it tucks a little bit of carrot in for actually accomplishing that work. And I think if we're going to design systems that achieve environmental justice, we have to have the right balance of carrots and sticks and levers in the right places, because you can't force people to go be cooperative. You just can't. In, in terms of the formal justice system, um, one of the things I think is extraordinarily important is for a di more diverse judiciaries which understand why these questions matter. Um, and I once gave a talk about this to 300 Canadian judges who are very, very much more the diverse than the judges in this country. Um, and I once argued a case in front of the Supreme Court where, as an aside, they said, we know this policy affects a lot more women than men, no that's just nothing to do with us. Well, if really, if judges, if judges think that that kind of justice is nothing to do with them, that their role is just about interpreting a statute, and they don't see that that is part of the judicial role, then I think we've got a real problem. Um, so, I, yeah, I think judges who are expected to ask and think about these questions really matter. 
um, and I, I could talk about legislation too, but I'm not going to do that now. <laughs> so, and because I know we have another question he here. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I thought your part on culture was absolutely fascinating, and I wanted to ask. So governments and firms alike have tried time and time again uh, to make consumers more aware of the benefits and the importance of clean technology. Uh, would you say that there's still ways to go in terms of the average consumer accepting and becoming more aware of clean technology and how important is that uh, in terms of innovation and in, in industry and in consumer markets? Oh, and I think it, the consumer markets vary. I mean, I think uh, the consumer interest in or awareness of clean technology across America in particular uh, varies on clear lines with political ideology. Um, you know, the, you have people that just look at an electric car as, you know, why, why should I change? Why do I need to change? It's a waste of time. It's going to be unreliable uh, and, and just aren't even interested in considering. Um, and when it doesn't pencil, you know, when it's more expensive, the majority of people that I know look at hybrid vehicles and it's $6,000 more and I intend to have the car for seven years and here's the price of gas and here's the savings. It doesn't pencil. It's, it's a status. It's a keeping up with the Joneses and that's not going to drive adoption. Uh, and so consumer awareness on the individual purchase, um, you're going to have to, again, I think talk to people's wallets and we're going to have to get policy in place that incentivizes that purchase because it's the cheaper thing to do. Uh, or it's the popular thing to do. You know, I, I hate to admit it, but we need social media influencers. We need Kim Kardashian online talking about how she loves her new heat pump. And that's going to be what it's going to take for a section of, of, of the community. Um, we're going to have to make it the desirable thing to do. Uh, but we also have to make it the affordable thing to do because right now it's not. Even if you do desire it, many people can't. And now with workforce problems and supply chain shortages, I know someone that's trying to put their convection cooktop in and stop using gas. Nine month waiting list to get the stove. It's going to hold us back. And I think that individual behavior adoption isn't the biggest lever we need to be moving. We have to be thinking at the bigger scale. It's great that you recycle. You recycling isn't going to save the planet. Don't stop recycling. <laughs> But we've got to be thinking about bigger systems and putting a lot more effort there, too. But that, is, I mean, that's slightly contrary to the, to the Dorothy thing, which I, I think that's very interesting, what you were saying about power, that those, those people up there around the back who you see as having power. And actually, maybe that isn't where the power is. So, because it can be, yeah, I, think, I think you're entirely right that you know, one person recycling or you know, cycling isn't necessarily going to change change the world, but a group of people imposing pressure will. So, yes. it, you know, it, I think it's quite important that people feel they have their power and their voice and they think, what am I going to do with it? Yeah, and it's the, it's the coming together and the convening mm. and the bigger, the bigger scale action. Uh, and, and, you know, I worry about timelines. The amount of electricians and HVAC installers we need to electrify our residences across the first world we don't have enough. Where are we going to get them? Who is going to manufacture those heat pumps, much less install them? Who is going to build the energy systems so that we can double? I've seen some reports that say quadruple the amount of energy that's on our grid to electrify everything. And the IPCC report, International Panel for Climate Change, tells us we have eight years left to hit our Paris climate goals. Are we going to make 300 million heat pumps and get them installed in eight years? I don't, I don't see where that happens. It's, it's, it's frustratingly depressing to start to do the math. We, we have to start thinking about what bigger scale levers can we move as a planet because we're going to run out of time. Yeah, I guess it's got, uh, sorry, you just wait for I, whoever gets there first. That's run, <laughs> run. <laughs> sure, yeah, sure clear it's going to be, I think. Yeah, thanks. Oh, I think it's going to, no, it's going to be Asma. <laughs> Good, give me another water break. Um, hi, first I wanted to say thank you for your, in your talk. I found it very um, insightful, especially as an engineer who is hoping to specialize in renewable energy. Um, I hope you. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hope you don't mind, but I actually have two questions. Uh, so, firstly, I wanted to ask about. Um, 
how I mean you spoke about the like the long valley of death that um, that these clean tech and I guess like general hardware companies have to go through. Um, how do the VCs that invest in them mitigate the risks that come with um, with these technologies and how long they take and the amount of money that uh, that is required? Uh, that's the first question. Should I ask the second one or the last? Oh, well, one? I say for the first question, we should ask a VC. Oh, uh, but, uh, you know, from our point of view, it's about trying to continually educate that the process will be different. The process mm -hmm. will be different. You know, the, the, the VC and the funding firms that we work with the most uh, internally at the Clean Tech Alliance that we partner with are, are focused on early seed funding, uh, pre-Series A, uh, and very, very early valuations. And they're, one is a B Corp and the other is a nonprofit. So they definitely have that uh, um, social good at the forefront ahead of the investment goal. And so they're preconditioned to understand and know that, and that they're, they're in, in investing for the social good um, and, and understand the long outcome. Mm -hmm. And I think the way that we, we need to talk with the rest of the VC world is start starting to hold up some success stories. And again, as we move through time, I think we're beginning to have more of those and that will help. And then understanding the, the market analysis, understanding the, the market opportunity for a fusion company that can power the entire third world nation. Uh, the, the fusion reactors being researched in Seattle are not the huge tokamaks, they're small. They fit under an eight by eight pop-up tent. Uh, you can put those in a lot of places on the planet. And, and one of our fusion companies is, is keenly focused on the fact that they expect 50% of their market to be Africa. And they're starting to design what their sales force needs to look like to do that authentically and appropriately. Uh, so I think just understanding the scale of those kinds of markets or what we need to be talking to VCs about. Yeah, thank you. Um, and my second question about uh, how you spoke about diversity and the importance of that, and it not just being something that is like a check, a checklist or a checkbox. Um, I wanted to ask how, um, as like say an employee or an executive in a company who doesn't really fit the, I guess like the stereotype of who are, like the other people who work there. Um, how how can companies empower those employees, uh, whether it be women or people of color, uh, to, I guess, like do what they can in their role and feel as if they do belong, um, they do belong there and they're not an outsider or they simply have been uh, employed just, just for, I guess, like what they look like or what they can fit on, on a piece of paper? Yeah, in The Loudest Duck, I just read it, it really tells the story so beautifully about and it tells it to the person that doesn't understand why he might need to even think about diversity. And it really lays the story out in very non-threatening, approachable, not shaming ways and terms. And I, I value the book for that. Um, and it really details the subtle ways in which people feel excluded at work. And it shows you how that exclusion happens when a young mother isn't going out for drinks in happy hour because she's going home to pick up her kid. Mm -hmm. That informal mentoring is happening at happy hour and she misses out. When um, someone has, doesn't join the group because they don't play golf and the informal mentoring happens on the golf course, they miss out when someone works remotely more than the rest of the team. Uh, they're unconsciously viewed as not being as much of a contributor and they miss out. Mm -hmm. You know, the real secret is um, if you've achieved any iota of success, send the elevator back down. Mm -hmm. um, we're gonna move the needle faster if you are a mentor and reach out to others. We've started a, a women's networking and mentoring group at the Clean Tech Alliance and it's for women at any of our member companies to come together. Uh, some of them are in situations where they're the only woman in their company mm -hmm. still. And so they don't have that opportunity for mentoring. Uh, and we're encouraging our larger companies to send middle management and give them the leadership opportunity to become a mentor. So we're trying to deliver benefit for our large companies and our small ones. So I think mentoring is the stronger answer. And if you don't have it in a role where you are, go find it. Mm -hmm. Can I and just to add to that, that um, I was talking to a, a Mansfield alum recently who's been doing a lot of work about diversity. She's a lawyer um, in the city of London. But one of the things that they've been doing is reverse mentoring because you don't know what you don't know. So yes, you send the lift down, but then you think, well, what do I know? And you try to empower people in different places of the organization to, to challenge, you know, to, to be not, not only um, entitled to, but encouraged to tell you how it is from a different perspective and to keep that memory 
going. And it's certainly something I try to do here, that I try to have networks with students of color to say, you tell me what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. You have to do it, I have to do it, because I'm, I'm the principal, but I want to know what it is you'd like me to do. And it, it, it's, it can be tricky to have those conversations. And, but yeah, I, think you have to, yeah, I do think it's really important for people to make and to ask for the frameworks where those conversations can happen rather than wait until there's a moment of conflict or feeling, I'm just fed up with that. This, this has made me burst at this point. So yeah, yeah I, th I think that's really important to think about what structures enable those conversations to have, happen in a productive way. Just tell me what I don't know. Of course, I don't know everything. Please tell me. Right. I'll try. You know, and and that's another. Um, what you're describing is also just genuine listening. Mm. And I'm going to come back to improv. That's another improv concept. To be effective at improv, you have to deeply listen to your teammates. Not just listen. I mean, you have to like listen with your entire body. And I think that bringing that culture in, even if you don't have it from above, if you're demonstrating it from the position you're in and you can influence someone else's journey. And if the organization really is that bad, find a different job. Go somewhere where you are valued and appreciated because we need your talents as a clean tech engineer uh, to, to go innovate and solve things. And any organization that's holding people back from that, it's not where your career is gonna thrive no matter what you look like. Mm -hmm. So that deep listening, yeah. that's great. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to stop sort of asking questions in this formal environment, but I'm about to take Mel across to the senior common room for a drink before dinner. So if anyone wants to come across, it's just we can follow that way and do carry on because um, we'd be very welcome to come. And it's been, it's been a fantastic exchange, I think, after your talk. So I think that's the measure of the talk, that the exchange after it was, yeah. was, was rich and engaged as well. So thank you very much. It thank really you. was wonderful. That is the last of the Mansfield Public Talks um, until um, October. Um, but in October, we're, we're going to have a, an Afghan MP, or former Afghan MP, a woman who was an MP in Afghanistan until the Taliban came in. We're going to have the director of the British Museum. We'll have the second Jocelyn Belbonnel science lecture. We'll have all sorts of things. So please check it out and do um, encourage people to come along. And I'm always open to ideas to the convening power of Oxford is such that some amazing people will come and talk if you ask them. Witness <laughs> Mel, so thank you very much thank indeed. Thank you. Thank you.